Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Department of Justice's 2015 Domestic Violence Awareness Month observation event. On behalf of the Office on Violence Against Women, I want to thank Attorney General Lynch, Associate Attorney General Delery, former Associate Attorney General Tom Pirelli, uh, and today's panelists, and all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. The Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013 includes a historic provision recognizing tribes' inherent power to exercise special criminal jurisdiction in certain cases of domestic violence. The purpose of today's discussion is to look at and ground the implement look at the on-the-ground implementation of this historic provision. I'd like to start by inviting Deborah Parker. She's the former vice chair of the Tulalip Tribes of Washington to open this year's Domestic Violence Awareness Month with a traditional song. Deborah. ACM Haslahel Sitsail Sasitsta Dohulelup. I see my native sisters are trying to rise for the song. <laughs> you, you may stand. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a, a brief uh, introduction of this song. Uh, the song comes from uh, our native sisters up in the Can Canadian Territory. And it's a song for the missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's, it's a song that, that I sing in a lot of our ceremonies and, and many of us to help reconnect us. And so it has four verses. And in the four verses, uh, we start from the east as the sun rises. And the, the first verse is dedicated to the, the babies, to our young babies. And uh, as we go to the south, the south is dedicated to our, our young children and our youth. As we go to the West, we honor the, uh, the spirits, the ancestors from the West, and we honor the adults, uh, many of us in this room. And if we go towards the North, we honor the North, and we honor uh, the, the elders, um, the wisdom keepers. And in the song, uh, on the fourth verse, I'm going to honor the missing and murdered Indigenous women and uh, the lives that were taken, uh, you know, too soon. Um, so that's just a brief explanation of this song. Uh, ACM.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Deb, for grounding and for opening our discussion today. Thank you. I now have the great pleasure of introducing Acting Associate Attorney General Stuart Dullery. Stuart F. Dullery was appointed Acting Associate Attorney General on September 17th of last year. He oversees the department's civil litigating components, grant-making components, including the Office on Violence Against Women, the Office of Tribal Justice, the Access to Justice Initiative, and the Service Members and Veterans Initiative. Prior to his current position, Mr. Dullery led the Civil Division, the largest litigating division in the department. He was confirmed by the United States Senate as the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division on August 1st of 2013. He joined the department in January 2009 as Chief of Staff and Counselor to the Deputy Attorney General and later served as Associate Deputy Attorney General. From August 2010 to March 2012, Mr. Dellery served as a Senior Counselor to the Attorney General. Please join me in welcoming Associate Attorney General Stuart Dellery. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for the uh, kind introduction. And uh, to you and the Office on Violence Against Women uh, for all of your commitment and hard work and for the effort to put together um, this program today. Um, it's an honor for me to join all of you uh, and our distinguished panelists and guests uh, this afternoon to commemorate Domestic Violence Awareness Month and to discuss your experiences implementing a historic provision of the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013. Um, the month of October is observed as Domestic Violence Awareness Month around the country by advocates, law enforcement, prosecutors, survivors, and many others to raise public awareness about domestic violence. And under the leadership of Attorney General Lynch and her predecessor, Attorney General Holder, the Department of Justice has made ending violence against women a top priority. We've also seen strong leadership from the Vice President and from many of our partners throughout the federal government. And some of the federal employees who are most committed to this work um, are in the audience today, and I want to personally thank all of you for your efforts as well. Um, although at the department we are proud of what we've accomplished in this area, we're also keenly aware of how much we still have to do. When one in four women suffer severe physical violence at the hands of an intimate partner, we cannot rest. Today's event highlights the department's commitment to working with our tribal partners to fight the scourge of violence against Native women in particular. And in a few moments, you'll hear from representatives of the Pascoyaki tribe of Arizona and the Tulalip tribes of Washington, including former vice chair, uh, Deb Parker, about their experience implementing the special provisions of the domestic violence criminal jurisdiction uh, under VAWA 2013. I want to thank them uh, for their leadership in making their tribes two of the first three tribes in the country to exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian offenders in the modern era. The Department of Justice has worked closely with these tribes and today's event is another step in the department's ongoing efforts to help tribes across the country make full use of this authority under the statute. Um, and I also want to recognize in particular Deb Parker, who by bravely sharing her personal story was instrumental in persuading Congress that it needed to address the jurisdictional gap that had left so many Native women unsafe in Indian country. Um, it's also a particular pleasure today to welcome back my friend and predecessor, Tom Pirelli. Uh, have, it's great to have him back at the department. Um, Tom is a passionate advocate for ending domestic and sexual violence, and he's equally dedicated to bringing justice to Indian country. And through his efforts here at the department and later before Congress, Tom championed the legislation that would become the tribal provisions of VAWA 2013. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we wouldn't be having the panel discussion that we're able to have today without Tom's vision and steadfast determination. So it's great to have you back again. Um, now, just as the pilot tribes have been working to hold non-Indian abusers accountable, we at the department have also stepped up prosecutions of felony-level domestic violence offenders in Indian country. 
VAWA 2013 also gave federal prosecutors new tools to address violence against women, and, uh, including in Indian Country. And in particular, the statute modernizes the federal criminal code by providing robust federal sentences for certain acts of domestic violence in the Indian Country, including a 10-year offense for assaulting an intimate partner by uh, strangling or suffocating. It's critically important uh, for law enforcement to respond forcefully to these crimes because almost half of all domestic violence victims have experienced at least one episode of strangulation before a lethal or non-lethal violent incident. These are high-risk offenders, and we can save lives by prosecuting them aggressively. After passage of VAWA 2013, the department sponsored training on public safety and tribal communities at our National Advocacy Center and throughout Indian Country, and our United States attorneys are making good use of their ability to bring these more serious charges. Over the past three years, federal prosecutors have indicted nearly 100 defendants on strangulation and suffocation charges, and we expect that number will continue to grow. Indeed, just last week in the District of New Mexico, a member of the Laguna Pueblo was sentenced to 51 months in prison for attempted manslaughter, assault of an intimate partner by strangling, and child abuse. And Duane Day assaulted his intimate partner, a Laguna Pueblo woman, by strangling her, causing her to lose consciousness and later to suffer a severe stroke. The United States Attorney, Damon Martinez, reports that after recovering from these life-threatening injuries, the victim is now a survivor who is using her voice to help other women who are victims of domestic violence. And significantly, the case was handled by Assistant United States Attorney David Adams, a former tribal prosecutor, who first joined the United States Attorney's Office in Albuquerque through a program funded by the Office of Violence Against Women. This tribal SAUSA project, as it's known, is another shining example of federal tribal partnership that is making enforcement more effective in Indian Country. And so now, with, uh, with those brief uh, remarks, it's my honor to introduce the 83rd Attorney General of the United States, Loretta Lynch. A lifelong prosecutor, Attorney General Lynch has long been a champion of, for public safety and protecting victims' rights throughout her distinguished career, including her tenure as the United States Attorney in the Eastern District of New York in Brooklyn, and in her contributions to department policy when she was chair of the Attorney General's Advisory Committee of U.S. Attorneys. And now, under her leadership as Attorney General, the Department remains committed to ensuring the safety, security, and sovereignty of American Indian and Alaska Native communities throughout the United States, and in particular, to fighting violence against women in Indian Country. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Attorney General Lynch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stuart, for that kind introduction. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming here today. And thanks to this outstanding panel uh, whose experiences are going to uplift and enrich us all. It is really a pleasure to welcome all of you to the department this afternoon. Um, and it's, a, as I said, a privilege to join so many distinguished tribal leaders and dedicated colleagues and passionate advocates for this important conversation. I also want to welcome back our department alumni. As I've said, you never really leave the Department of Justice. Uh, we are like a family, and we hope to extend that family to all of you who are visiting here today uh, through the work and contributions that we look forward to sharing with you in the months and years to come as well. We're here to talk about a very important issue. It is a tragic fact that violence affects women of every background in every region of the United States. But the story is even worse for women in Indian Country, where in recent years, violence against women has become an epidemic. Yes, an epidemic and a public health issue. Now the numbers, as you all know all too well, are frankly shocking. According to a nationwide survey by the National Institute of Justice, one-third of American Indian women experience rape in their lifetime. And a survey by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, because again, yes, this is a public health issue, this survey showed that nearly 40% of Native women have been victims of rape, physical violence, or stalking by a spouse or by a partner. And an NIJ-funded survey found that on some reservations, Indian women are murdered at a rate more than 10 
times the national average, more than 10 times the national average. But until recently, the jurisdictional issues and the flawed statutes and insufficient resources that we've all inherited prevented tribal and federal law enforcement from effectively addressing these heinous acts, especially when the perpetrators were not Indians, even when the incident involved a non-Indian man assaulting his Indian wife on tribal land. This is not just a gap in jurisdiction. This was a chasm in justice. That's what that was. And this has been a fraught and deeply challenging issue. But with the decisive action and the vital partnership of the leaders across Indian country, including many here in this room, including people who brought their personal stories to Washington, we have made encouraging progress. Most notably, as we've noted, through the bipartisan passage of the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013, which incorporated the provisions that were recommended by this Justice Department that for the first time in decades empower Indian women who experience abuse by non-Native men. That's an historic piece of legislation, long overdue but historic nonetheless, because it recognized the tribe's inherent ability to exercise special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction over all offenders on their lands. And it made it clear that tribal courts are fully entitled to enforce civil protection orders. And it strengthened the federal sentences for certain acts of domestic violence in Indian country, ensuring that wrongdoers are held wholly accountable for their crimes, regardless of where they occur. Now, why was this legislation so important? We've had VAWA for 21 years. Why was this such a key provision? Because by what and how we prosecute, we as a society indicate both what and whom we value. Let me say that again. Because by what and how we prosecute, we as a society indicate both what and whom we value. And it is time, it is past time, that Native and Alaskan women are valued as they fully deserve. That's why that legislation was so important. And that's why I'm so delighted that we have leaders here from the tribes that have been working on this issue for so long. The leaders of the Tulalip and the Pasquayaki tribes have led the way in implementing these essential provisions, along with Oregon's Umatilla tribe. You were the first three tribes to be selected as part of a pilot project to exercise your jurisdiction in domestic violence matters before the law took full effect this past March. And thanks to your determination, your perseverance, and your vigilance, you've demonstrated that with greater control over your own lands and closer partnership with the federal government, justice can and will be done. This has been a great year. It's been a banner year. Over the course of this pilot year, remember, this is just the beginning, more than 25 cases have been brought against non-Indians by tribal prosecutors and more than 200 defendants have been charged under VAWA's enhanced federal assault statutes. Just as crucially, you've been working to ensure that other tribes can replicate this experience and build on your success through your participation in the department's inter-tribal working group. And we greatly appreciate everyone sharing their stories and contributing their energy to that. Through that particular group, these tribes have demonstrated their best, their best practices, shared experiences, and shared tools and technical assistance with more than 400 fellow nations who will soon be able to pick up this charge and lead it. Your sustained and your concerted efforts send a clear message that no individual is above the law and that no one, no one, should ever be denied the law's protection, no matter who they are or where they live. Now in this work, and in all of the Obama administration's efforts in Indian Country, we have been proud to work together with the sovereign tribal nations to expand opportunity, to promote equal justice, and to replace, frankly, a shameful historical pattern of mistrust, disregard, and termination. And it's been our hope and our goal to replace that pattern with one that evinces a strong commitment to partnership, to collaboration, and to respect. Under the leadership of my predecessor and your friend, former Attorney General Eric Holder, 
the Department of Justice deepened cooperation between tribal justice leaders and U.S. Attorney's offices to an extent that had never been done before. We've deployed tribal special assistant U.S. attorneys to prosecute Indian Country cases in federal and tribal courts alike, resulting in stronger working relationships and a sharp increase in federal prosecutions on tribal lands. We've created a Tribal Nations Leadership Council made up of men and women elected by their peers to advise the Attorney General on matters critical to Indian Country. And we succeeded in passing the Tribal Law and Order Act which has significantly broadened tribal authorities' capacity to uphold the rule of law. And we took important steps to institutionalize our approach so that the partnerships that we have built can be as durable and as long-lasting as they are effective. In one of my own first acts as Attorney General, I called upon Congress to help remove barriers to voting in Indian Country, remove the barriers to voting in Indian Country, so that American Indians and Alaska Natives can enjoy the full participation in our democratic institutions that is their fundamental right. And I will continue to promote and to advance all these efforts to help bolster the sovereignty of tribal nations as well as the safety of Indian and Alaska Native communities. Now, of course, none of us should have any illusions that the challenges that we face ahead will be easy to overcome but they never have been. These are complex issues. They have a long and difficult history. But as I look out over this room, and as I meet and speak with our panelists and look forward to what they have to say, I am hopeful about all that we will achieve, as well as eager to continue the work that we have begun together. I want to thank all of you for coming to the department today to commemorate not just this month, but the work that has been done to commemorate this statute and to save lives. Thank you for your trust in working with us. Thank you for your partnership, for sharing your stories and your energy. And thank you so much for your steadfast devotion to the cause of justice on behalf of all of the people there who lift a silent voice and cry for help. Let them know that we are here for them and that we will continue to be so, not just now, but forever. So thank all of you so, so much. Thank you so much, Attorney General Lynch, for your remarks, and more importantly, for your commitment to ending all forms of violence in Indian Country and across the nation. I'd next like to introduce Sam Hirsch. He's the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and National Resources Division. Sim has, uh, uh, Sam has been instrumental in the department's major policy initiatives involving Native Americans, including providing critical leadership in developing the provisions of the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013. While Associate Attorney General Delry rightly credited uh, Tom Pirelli for his vision, it was really Sam Hirsch that did the work. He did the work in defining and in implementing the Special Domestic Violence Criminal Jurisdiction. For his work, he received the Attorney General's 2013 Award for Exceptional Service in Indian Country. Please join me in welcoming Sam Hirsch. Thank you very much. The late Professor Phil Fricke asked us to imagine a world where every question in Indian law is approached not as an excuse for a bitter tug of war, but rather as simply an important matter for conversation between sovereigns to be resolved by negotiation in good faith with an eye toward accommodating the federal and tribal interests not only on this question, but in a manner that strengthens the long-term relationship as well. VAWA 2013 is the perfect example of that cooperative approach. The story of VAWA 2013 begins and ends with the tribes. It was tribal leaders who first called attention to the shameful level of violence perpetrated against Native women by their non-Native husbands and boyfriends. And in the end, it has been the tribes that have created new approaches to prosecuting these crimes and to making their own communities safer and more secure. We're very fortunate this afternoon to have on the panel 
five tribal leaders who were integral to both stages of the success story at the far end of the table from the past we aki tribe in arizona we have fred or being a red raise your hand and o j flores fred is passed by aki's attorney general and o j is passed by aki's chief prosecutor both have degrees in criminal justice and both are graduates of the university of arizona college of law and proud members of the past we aki tribe fred is also a former police officer and o j is a former college football champion whose team captured the big sky conference title back in two thousand three from the two layla tribes in washington state we have let's say, hands up deb parker who you've met before michelle demmer and sharon jones hayden as the associate ag already explained deb who was the former to layla vice chair was integral to congress passing vow in 2013 as she repeatedly tirelessly and very courageously told members of congress and their staffs of her real life experiences as a victim of horrific violence michelle a former tribal judge and currently a leader in the Tulalip Reservation, uh, Reservation Attorney's Office, has been one of the architects of the VAWA pilot project, as you'll soon hear. And Sharon is not only the tribe's domestic violence and sexual assault prosecutor, but also a special assistant U.S. attorney, which means she can prosecute these crimes in both tribal and federal courts. Although the story of VAWA 2013 begins and ends with these courageous women and men and their colleagues at the Umatilla tribes in Oregon and at countless tribes across the nation. I fully endorse Stuart Delery's earlier comment that none of us would be here today celebrating VAWA 2013 were it not for the person who will moderate this distinguished panel. I'm speaking, of course, of the former Associate Attorney General, my old boss, and my good friend Tom Pirelli. Although tribes had complained about their lack of criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians for decades, before Tom, no one, tribal or federal, had actually said, well, let's sit down and draft some legislative language to empower tribal law enforcement while properly protecting the rights of both victims and defendants. And Tom did that. And he did a lot more to make sure that all the relevant components of this department of the Interior Department, of HHS, and of the White House coalesced behind a single, specific legislative proposal, down to the last comma. And it was DOJ's proposal that Congress ultimately enacted almost verbatim. Put simply, without Tom's leadership, VAWA 2013 would not have restored tribes' authority to prosecute these domestic violence crimes. So it is a great honor for me today to introduce not only Tom, but the tribal leaders whose vision he helped implement. Together, together, their efforts have thwarted perpetrators of domestic violence, bolstered tribal justice systems, and strengthened the relationship between the United States and all <coughs> tribal nations. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our panel and its moderator. Well, thank you, Sam. Uh, that's an extraordinary introduction. Uh, for folks who remember the last time I sat on this stage, it was my farewell, and it was a roast. Uh, so it was a little bit different setting. Um, but I want to thank, I really want to thank the department for having me back for this important event. Thank the Attorney General and Acting Associate Attorney General Delery for being here with Director Hansen and, and Sam to emphasize the department's commitment to combating the epidemic of violence against Native women. And to set the stage for our panel, because I think it's, it's, you know, the point of this is to really get into the impact of the law and what is going on on the ground. I think it's worth remembering the framework of the special domestic violence criminal ju jurisdiction provisions. And I'll speak for myself to say I, I hope someday we get to stop saying special and they're just the norm. Um, but the philosophy behind those provisions really was an extension of the Tribal Law and Order Act, which was based on the idea that tribal nations with sufficient resources and authority are best able to address violence in their communities. The Tribal Law and Order Act offered additional sentencing authority to tribal courts and prosecutors if certain procedural protections were established. Now, the special domestic violence criminal provisions extend on that promise by taking an incredibly important first step 
to erasing the harm that the Oliphant case did to tribal communities. And under these provisions, as we've discussed, tribal nations and their prosecutors have the authority to protect Native women and prosecute those who commit acts of domestic violence against intimate partners, whether offenders are Native or non-Native. And it was this latter point, giving tribal nations authority to bring cases against non-Indians, that was a critical step forward. I'm sure that all of our panelists can tell stories of Native women attacked by their non-Native intimate partners only to find that the nearest and most responsive law enforcement, tribal law enforcement, could do nothing to help. When I testified before Congress, uh, I, I often talked about the absurdity that if a Native woman struck back at her abuser on the steps of the tribal courthouse, uh, she could be prosecuted, uh, but her abuser could not be touched and could, could act without fear of prosecution from the most responsive and nearest law enforcement authority. The act, the, the VAWA was intended to provide tribal law enforcement and tribal nations with new and meaningful tools to punish and hopefully end that violence. But with this new authority came new obligations. Tribes exercising the authority over crimes of domestic violence against non-natives had to establish a set of protections similar to those in, in state court criminal prosecutions, again, building on the Tribal Law and Order Act and the Civil Rights Act of 1968. I think what is often lost in this conversation is that many, many tribes already had these protections in their criminal justice systems, uh, but for other tribes, uh, there were aspects of it that they would need to implement. And the protections are those with which I think many of us are familiar. The right to counsel, uh, the obligation to have law-trained judges, known and publicly available procedures, uh, issues about uh, the jury pool, and, and then rights to go to federal court uh, on a habeas petition at the end of trial. One important aspect of these provisions are their real limits on the offenses that are covered. The provisions only focus on intimate partners and domestic violence committed by those intimate partners. The victim had to be an Indian, the crime must be committed on in, in Indian country, and the perpetrator had to have sufficient ties, whether through being a spouse or an intimate partner or a, da a dating partner or an Indian who resides in Indian country. It doesn't reach uh, many of the crimes that surround acts of domestic violence, crimes against children or, or crimes committed by a stranger to the community. Why? Not because those crimes aren't prevalent and not because tribal communities are, desire to and would be able to prosecute those crimes, but rather it was a recognition that this was a first step, an, attack, an attempt to attack the most serious problem first. All of us who believe in tribal nations and their justice system certainly plan and hope on expanding this authority to other crimes. So today we're going to have a, a chance to talk about what's really happening on the ground and we're going to start uh, with presentations first by Pasquayaki and then by the Tulalip tribes to talk about uh, their experience implementing the statute, the challenges that they've had and the successes that they've had. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to first start by, by thanking the Department of Justice, the folks that work here. Um, Sam, Tom Pirelli, uh, Sam Hirsch, Tracy Tulu, all these folks that have been helping us for the past year or two to get this uh, off the ground and, and uh, get us to a point where we can start exercising this jurisdiction. Uh, I'm, I'm here on behalf of my tribe, but um, you know, when I think about the Violence Against Women Act and, and that authority and that restoration of, of jurisdiction uh, for the tribe, for our tribal leaders, it was consistent with our history. Uh, it was something that we've always done, uh, protect our homeland, protect our children, protect our women. Uh, and um, that's, that's been, for us, something we've been doing for hundreds of years. And so uh, VAWA is not in, uh, inconsistent with that. Uh, the first contact with non-Indians for the tribe was in 1533. Uh, and we've been uh, at war for a couple hundred years protecting uh, our people. And so this was something that uh, our tribal leaders felt it was necessary to do. Um, you know, people talk about the cost, but the cost of doing nothing is, is higher when you consider the, the female victims, the children uh, on our reservation. So we're going to talk a little bit about our experience. We're going to talk about the cases. Um, we'll, we won't get into the law too much. Just. Uh, uh, from my perspective, it's complicated. It's complicated for law enforcement uh, to have to, to, to think about these jurisdictional issues uh, at midnight uh, after a violent event. Uh, it's very complicated. 
Uh, we've had um, a lot of a lot of cooperation with our local U.S. attorney, uh, with our state partners, and so this um, at this point in time it's been a very successful project. Uh, and just to give you some context about uh, where we are and some of the factors that that come into play. Uh, we're on a small reservation southwest of Tucson. Tucson, Arizona is in the southern part of the state of Arizona. It's about 50 miles from the, from the border. Uh, Tucson's a major drug corridor and we have uh, close to between 19 and 20,000 tribal members, uh, enrolled tribal members with about four to 5,000 on our reservation uh, who live there. Uh, generally living in, in uh, low-income rental housing uh, on the reservation. The census indicates that there's 500 non-Indians that live on the reservation. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate that is. That's self-reported information. Uh, some folks might consider themselves Hispanic. Um, the number seems high, but it's. Um, I think uh, we'll have to start looking at that, but that's a major factor uh, in these cases. Also, there's about 800 folks that work in our tribal government or casino enterprise uh, who are non-Indian, and so you have folks working together. They're going to they're going to they're going to get into relationships. Uh, I told you our first contact uh, with non-Indians was in 1533. Uh, they they've been wanting to hang out with us ever since, and, and, right? <laughs> they've been wanting to date us. <laughs> Sometimes beat us up, but. Uh, this law helps us address the jurisdiction we didn't have prior to this. Uh, the poverty rate is high, uh, 44 percent. Uh, the children that, that live in poverty uh, is fairly high as well. Unemployment, even though we have a, an enterprise, it still hovers around 23 to 25 percent. And those numbers are consistent with some of your major cities, your cities like Baltimore, the, the, the underlying factors that cause crime and domestic violence. Uh, these, these numbers are consistent with those numbers. Um, our households are made up of multi-generational families, elders, uh, grandparents, uncles, grandkids, children, uh, all in one home. And then we've got significant issues surrounding substance abuse and domestic violence. Those are the major issues on the reservation. I'm going to turn the mic over to, to to OJ and he's going to talk about the cases. Um, so the numbers that we're going to talk to you about are essentially um, are coming from the pilot period from the, the first year. The numbers have increased slightly since then. We're about a year and a half now since the initiation of the pilot period. But just to give uh, uh, numbers and kind of uh, extrapolate that to you know, the roughly 566 other tribes out there, this will give a good snapshot of, of what's occurring. During the pilot period, we had 18 cases um, arise um, out of VAWA arrests. That accounted for approximately 25% of my office's domestic violence caseload arising out of the reservations. We've had um, uh, six convention convictions now. Um, the conviction came after the pilot period ended, but the offense occurred within the, the time frame. We had one acquittal, um, and that was a, a jury trial that we had. Um, we uh, prosecuted a non-Indian uh, African-American male who was on our reservation dating a tribal member, um, and he assaulted his, his partner, and he wanted to take it to trial. And we uh, took the uh, same-sex VAWA domestic violence uh, case to trial, he sat in front of, uh, you know, seven jurors mixed with uh, uh, tribally enrolled members and non-Indians as well. Um, and at the end of the day, they found uh, that the tribe did not prove that they were in a relationship given the dynamics uh, and, and openness of the uh, same-sex relationship within the reservation. Um, what that case highlighted for us is that the system worked. We were able to arrest detain, jail, arraign, charge, put through a jury, pretrial motions, and let a jury decide whether or not that this individual had committed an offense. And at the end of the day, we're proud to say that our system worked the way that it was supposed to. 
Um, we had 15 defendants during that pilot period. These 15 defendants up to VAWA accounted for 84 police contacts within the reservation. Um, three of these guys have reoffended since VAWA came into law. Uh, in fact, one of the guys was uh, a repeat offender for the third time and uh, we were able to get a conviction um, on him uh, on the last arrest and we'll explain a little bit of the, of the reasons why and the limitations of all in just a minute. Uh, a little bit about the victims. We, there was 13 female victims, two male victims. The average age about uh, 30 years, 30 years of, uh, old, ranging from 19 to 43. Uh, most of these um, victims and defendants are in long-term relationships. Um, these defendants are ingrained in our community. They're not simply driving through and, and causing these issues uh, or being s sort of the unusual or anomaly type domestic violence scenarios. Um, they, they belong to the community. After their arrest and even some of them after their convictions, they stayed in the community. Um, uh, the majority of them are, are sharing uh, children in common. Uh, three of the female victims were married partners. Uh, we had two cases arising, arising out of uh, violation, violations of orders of protection. Um, three cases involved orders of protection even after uh, VAWA was implemented. We like to uh, point out that we think that VAWA shed some light on the ability for the tribal courts to impose orders of protection against non-tribal members in instances where you know maybe the case wasn't as strong and the officers could assist or victim services could assist the victims get orders of protection so that way in future prosecutions the cases would be um, a lot easier to prove. Uh, one of the most significant numbers that we like to point out and, and we'll hit a, a little bit about it about the VAWA jurisdictional um, the text of VAWA is that during these uh, 18 cases there was 18 children present during the offenses these are 18 victims that we were not able to charge for their victimization against the defendants. Um, this is something that I know all panelists up here are, are interested in ensuring that gets addressed in any sort of revisions. Um, the ages range from infant to 11 years old, the average age being 40. Um, three of these cases resulted in open dependency or child welfare cases. Um, where several of the children were um, successfully removed from the home. It was a very volatile situation from them. And although we weren't able to prosecute the defendant for causing their victimization, we were able to remove them from the home that they no longer have to be subject or witness to any of those events occurring. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Fred talk a little bit about the, the criminal history and, and lead into a little bit about um, the, uh, the impacts and the concerns that we have with, with the VAWA statute itself. So on the uh, offenders, only three of the offenders did not have criminal records in the state of Arizona. And most of them had uh, pretty lengthy criminal histories in the state of Arizona. Uh, seven, of the, seven of the offenders had been arrested for violent crimes, weapons or threats, assaults, uh, weapons and misconduct, trespassing, domestic violence, uh, things like that. Two of the offenders were felons, uh, having been arrested and convicted for burglary in the state of Arizona. Uh, two of the offenders had active felony warrants, uh, one out of Oklahoma for armed robbery, another one for burglary. Uh, the Oklahoma offender was the same-sex case that OJ just talked about. Uh, felon from Oklahoma, wanted, uh, living on the reservation in Tucson, Arizona in tribal housing. Um, and like OJ said, uh, you know, all of these offenders had been involved in 84 police contacts prior to VAWA. So we couldn't do anything before this authorization. We'd simply um, contact them, perhaps take them off the reservation. They'd come right back. Um, and they kind of knew about this jurisdictional gap. One of them said, you, know, you can't do anything to me anyway. Uh, so <clears throat> there, you know, the majority of them were uh, unemployed. Um, the, the felon was essentially staying in the home watching the children that he had in common with the tribal member. Uh, they're now off the reservation uh, and he's got a warrant for his arrest. Um, so at least eight of the offenders were living in tribal housing 
Uh, the other ones were coming by, um, they were in long-term dating relationships. Uh, seven, of the, seven of the incidents involved alcohol. Most of the offenders and victims appeared to be unemployed. None of the tribal victims or defendants appeared to be active cultural participants. Uh, that's important on the reservation. It's a, it's a data point that, that we were looking at specifically. Um, I, I would tend to believe if they were active cultural participants that they, they might not be involved in this, these types of offenses. It's still early to, to kind of make conclusions about the data that we've gathered, but these are things that we want to, to pay uh, attention to as we go forward. Uh, it's very important for us. Um, one defendant said, you can't do anything to me anyway. Uh, one offender was a lineal descendant, a lineal tribal descendant, who did not qualify for tribal enrollment. So when you talk about non-Indians, it would also include what essentially is a tribal member who grows up on the reservation, but no, no longer qualifies for enrollment. So that's going to be happening across the country uh, in the next few years. It'll, it'll become more prominent. Um, and, and I don't know at that time if you, if you consider them non-Indians or not, but it's something that's already happening on reservations. Uh, three of the offenders now have tribal warrants. Uh, one for uh, pre-prosecution, two for post-prosecution. Uh, they've offended on the reservation, they were arrested, they've left the jurisdiction. We're working on a process, an IGA with the county to uh, bring these folks back, domesticate our warrants, extradite them back to the reservation so we can prosecute them for their crimes. Now really quick, I'll just talk about some of the, some of the facts of the few cases to kind of highlight how uh, you know the, these cases are pretty typical of any prosecution for any DV type offense. Uh, one example we have is a sandwich case where the defendant um, assaulted his his wife um, for not making his lunch correctly, and for as he said not doing the laundry. Um, he would later on to go to say that he blamed the victim for uh, saying that he, she pushed him first, and yet when when he uh, punched and, and pushed her down the couch and choked her and the, the children were actually uh, present during this incident occurring and uh, they told law enforcement that you know he pushed mommy down and held her on the couch. Um, law enforcement was able to take photographs and marks on, on her uh, on the victim's neck and we were able to successfully prosecute this individual. Um, in a screwdriver case that we have and you'll see a little bit about this in just a minute um, this is an order of protection uh, violation where the defendant had an order of protection uh, against him involving an incident occurring just months prior where um, he assaulted the, the same victim with, with a screwdriver and there the, the, the defendant admitted that he knew he wasn't supposed to be in contact with the victim when law enforcement arrived. Um, this individual was uh, successfully going through federal prosecution. Uh, the multiple 911 case um, here the victim initially called 911 to report that the father of her children uh, was being um, was intoxicated and being obnoxious uh, essentially. He's a non-tribal member and law enforcement respond, they pick him up and they take him, they remove him off the reservation. Um, Forty years of, of habit are, are, are rough to break. So then uh, he comes back and he then, um, now he's angry, he's had some more um, liquid courage and he's pounding on the door and when she opens the door he tries to hit her he's so intoxicated though he misses swings and falls down um, a little while later um, this individual uh, stemming from these incidents um, several hours later 911 receives 41 calls within an hour it's from the children of the home because mom and dad are, are still arguing and going at it, and, but the child kept hanging up every time he would call. And eventually police were um, able to respond, and this uh, is one of the cases that I'm happy to report. We were able to remove the children. This happens to be a, one of our, our frequent flyers through the office. Hey, OJ, I'm going to ask, I'm going to, I want to try and move along to make sure that Tulalip has time to talk, and then we can have a little discussion, so. Sure. Thank you. Did you guys have, do you want to conclude with that? Because I, right. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, 
Just in, in, in implementing this, we've run into some challenges. Um, a big one has been the uh, Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Castleman. Right after we started to uh, implement, we had our first few cases. The Supreme Court came down with this case. It essentially says that the federal definition of domestic violence uh, requires a physical touching, which would mean an assault, an, an assault essentially. So um, we had a number of cases that were uh, threats, um, criminal damage, damage of property, things like that, that we had charged, but we had to dismiss um, in, in consideration of that Castleman case. And so what happened after that is that at least three of those offenders ended up reoffending and actually physically assaulting the uh, victims in the, in the previous cases. So, uh, you know, we were, we were trying to do some prevention. Uh, the case came up at an inopportune time and it's impacted the way we're doing business. We were just uh, talking to some Congress folks today about changing the definition, uh, reworking it so it can um, actually fix uh, the problem it's created for uh, VAWA. Uh, obviously, another issue is no direct funding. VAWA had, uh, I think, $5 million in it for uh, implementing tribes. That hasn't been appropriated yet. Uh, there's other issues like access to the NCIC database for uh, the national database that police departments put in, uh, criminal information into. Uh, a lot of tribes don't have access to this database. The Oklahoma offender, um, when we first arrested him, we didn't have the information on his felony warrant. That would have been important uh, for law enforcement. It's important going forward when you're making bond determinations. Um, so little things like that, there's, there's some problems still with the law that we've found out about that we're addressing with, with our federal partners and uh, we're going to be going back to Congress and asking them to uh, help us out with this. Thanks so much. Let me turn it over to the two Ayla. Uh, just want to thank the Pasco Yaki tribe for their um, informative information today and also thank the Department of Justice and all of our partners and, and all of you in this room here today uh, for being here to listen to our stories and to uh, continue to work with us to take direct action so that we can provide safety and justice uh, for our nations. Um, once again, my name is Deborah Parker, and I served as a vice chairwoman of the Tulalip Tribes um, all the way until April. I finished my three-year term, elected term, and, uh, and uh, needed to step down. Uh, the reason for that was that my first week in 2012, when I first uh, was elected as vice chairwoman, uh, came here to D.C. and uh, continued to fight for the Violence Against Women Act and it was a, a day much like today that I walked into Senator Murray's office and was informed that um, the tribal provisions were not going to be included in the VAWA. And so um, it's just sitting up here, it's so surreal because um, as I heard that the women, the native, our native women would not be included, um, I asked the reasons why, and I heard all, all the stories as, as I've heard before, but one of the reasons uh, was that there was not a face. There wasn't a face, a native face. It just, it, it didn't, from what I heard, it just didn't have enough uh, push, and, and there were a lot of uh, senators who were uh, opposing extended jurisdiction. So um, sitting in Senator Murray's office, uh, I just, everything came across my mind thinking, well, wait, how am I going to protect my, my nation, the women that I serve, Tulalip tribes? How are all the other Native American women supposed to receive justice when, when our government is not, uh, not assisting us in, in the way, in the manner in which they should? to protect all women on the soil. All women in the United States deserve to be protected and Native women are no exception to that. So that, that was my message. But sitting in the office, um, my, my mother is Yaki Apache, and um, so from the Yaki tribe, and my, my father is uh, Tulalip. So uh, I don't know if there's any coincidence here or anything at all, but some sort of higher justice 
but I'm sitting here with both of my tribes. And um, <laughs> as I am, uh, as I sat in Senator Murray's office, um, you know, I left and, and had to accept that the bill was going to be passed in two days without the uh, native provisions. As I walked down the halls of Congress, all I can think of is uh, my my uh, my grandmother generations back on my Yaqui side and the story in which was passed down that she was uh, raped by a Spanish soldier and that the uh, her her boys came to her rescue and they were threatened by the uh, law enforcement that they would be locked up locked away so they fleed our their traditional territory and um, went east and so my mom was raised born and raised you know generations later my mom and my mom was born and raised in Texas uh, my father from the Tulalip tribes in the state of Washington uh, was sent uh, away on a program um, and that's where he met my mom so you know that that story I share that because um, I, I knew of the victimization in my mom's side of the family but we didn't really talk about it there was never any justice my father's side I grew up on my reservation in, in Tulalip and again we, we don't talk about we don't talk about uh, you know rape domestic violence because we knew that nothing would happen even if you did even if you called a police officer and asked them to come and, and help you on your reservation they would say I'm sorry we lack jurisdiction and this is this is no story this is me at 13 years old calling for help because my aunt was raped and I was trying to protect the children no no justice there so um, I was a young child the same things happened no justice so uh, sitting here today it is such an honor to um, to say that we now have women in our tribe who are receiving justice Thanks to folks in this room, and thanks to our, our staff here, and tribal leaders, the Yaki Nation, those who have stepped forward to um, to make sure that our Native women are protected. Um, so I just I, I wanted to, to start out there because it's very not only um, personal to myself, but I know to to all of the women who uh, who haven't received justice and are just now looking at hey maybe this this is going to be a day where I can. I can step forward and there's going to be a court, there's going to be a police officer to help protect me. So I just really wanted to, to start out with that. And as you see in the picture here, these are uh, the, the one back, yeah, this one right here. Um, this is some of the elders I look up to. Um, we're in our cedar hat, we, we weave our baskets. Our women are very, to us, as we say, our women are very sacred. And uh, we have, I'm holding water there, and this is a water ceremony we did to bless the water. Um, that, that's our role is to take care of the earth to take care of the children so as life givers we are uh, looked upon in our tribe as as sacred um, I'm sad to say we've we've gone so far away from that because of uh, boarding schools and, and intergenerational trauma so um, we're fighting we're fighting to get that back we're fighting to to uh, to take our life back so just wanted to uh, highlight that picture um, the Tula tribes uh, were a sovereign nation uh, located in the northwest corner of uh, Washington State. Um, we have an enrolled membership of 4,533 tribal members. Uh, we're known as the Snohomish people. Uh, the Snohomish people, we come from the river, we come from the water. And as you see, um, a lot of our traditions, we have our ocean going canoes. Um, so we invite you all to come out uh, in the summertime to uh, to witness uh, how we we journey from from village from reservation to reservation and do ceremony. So that's a picture of uh, some of our traditional canoes out in the water. Every time I see that, I want to go out and pull canoes. So. Mm -hmm. Sur surrounding our water, surrounding the bay, we have our traditional longhouse. We have um, a medical facility. We have. Um, our gym for our youth, uh, our fire department, the Tulalip Bay Fire Department. We have a Tulalip Boys and Girls Club. So we have lots of programs that we really work hard to make sure that our community can can um, can prosper, can live, and and celebrate life within our own traditional territory. 
Um, here's the, the, some of our faces of Tulalip. When Congress said, oh, I'm sorry, we just didn't have the face. Well, here you go. Here's some beautiful faces. Um, and the, the girl over here to the, let's see, would be your, your left. That is my daughter. Her name is, uh, her tr traditional name is Halia, uh, Kaya George. And she's with some of our uh, Tulalip Boys and Girls Club girls and so we're really working to bring back justice to, to, the, to our little girls and to the future and, and create a, a violence-free violence uh, community as it, it, once, it once was. Um, the picture to your right here um, was when the Seattle Times has asked, asked me if they would um, do an interview with me and I had done some interviews about how, how we really needed to pass the Violence Against Women Act and so I told just a few ladies, I said, do you want to just join me at the uh, Tulalip Museum, at our Hubbold Museum, and uh, we're going to do an interview. And so uh, it's about domestic violence, sexual assault, and so you can tell anyone else if they want to come. And I thought, well, instead of just interviewing me, they can maybe interview some of our other uh, women who have been violated. Um, and that was probably a couple days before the interview. By the uh, second day, when, when the interview occurred, um, or the third day actually, uh, all these women started walking in the room, one by one by two, three, four, and pretty soon our whole, the whole room was filled with um, our Tulalip women. They wanted to know how can they receive justice. And um, each one stepped forward and said, I was abused, I've never told anyone. The next one, I, I was abused. Me too, me too, me too, me too. Okay, I thought, wow, who has not been abused in our, you know, in this room? And uh, it was so chilling. It was so, um, because for so long we've remained silent. We haven't been able to say anything because, again, it wouldn't matter. There was no justice. We had no courts. We had no police officers. Nobody had any, apparently had any jurisdiction on the reservation. So. Um, so this was very much, as you can see in their eyes, women who are ready to receive justice. And, uh, and I know that with, with our court systems, we're, ready, we're here, we're ready to, um, to finally to start to protect our, our women and children. So that's our faces. Good afternoon. So I'm, as you've heard, February 2014, the Tulalip tribes began exercising its inherent sovereign authority to prosecute non-Indian domestic violence perpetrators who violated Indian women. Since that time, we've had 11 cases with nine defendants. These nine defendants um, are racially diverse. We have three Caucasians, we have two African American, three Hispanic, and one unenrolled Canadian Indian. The um, age range has been between 21 and 35, and I guess what's really notably uh, astounding st statistic is that of these nine individuals, since 2008, our tribal law enforcement has had over 100 contacts with these individuals. So between 2008 and 2014, these men have just drained our tribal resources for a number of calls. In, at Tulalip, we refer those cases, previously referred those cases to the Snohomish County Sheriff and Prosecutor's Department and hoped that they would take them. Now, if they're a domestic violence case, we charge them. And of these cases, we've had a 75% um, success rate in the cases that have gone to adjudication. We have six that have pled guilty. They pled guilty. They felt that they had done the charge and they were going to agree um, that, they, um, that they had to be held accountable. Two are in pre-trial and two, unfortunately, were dismissed due to evidentiary issues. One case was so severe that it was transferred to the U.S. Attorney's Office. This is a case in which a woman was held captive for multiple days by her abusing um, partner, non-Indian. He, um, there were two children in the home. He would make her sit in the easy boy chair and um, he would throw knives at her. So when she finally escaped that three days later, 
um, and the tribal police showed up. There were multiple holes all around the um, lazy boy chair in which he would make her sit there and threaten her um, and just taunt her. In that case, he additionally did that to her two-year-old child, and he also um, assaulted um, another child that was in the home, which brings up the fact that of this, these cases, five children have been victims of crime in these not, uh, 11 cases, and we are unable to prosecute on behalf of those children. Those voices are going unheard, except for the case that's in the U.S. Attorney's Office that will be prosecuted fully. So, as you can see, not all charges can be prosecuted, and um, not all related crimes either. Uh, the title here says legal challenges, but thankfully we have not had one yet. <laughs> we haven't had a, a habeas petition. Um, we had anticipated that we would be hearing from some of those folks before now, but, but thankfully not. Um, however, there, there have been barriers, some of which were anticipated, some of which were frankly not anticipated. Um, this U.S. v. Castleman case was mentioned by more than one, I think, of us up here, and if you haven't had a chance to read it, you're really missing a treat, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you guys don't have much else to do, so think about it. Um, we call it, well, I call it the Muddy Waters case because um, because I'm a blues fan, and because this just muddied the situation um, to um, a really frustrating extent in terms of the kinds of cases that we're able to bring. Um, those of you who have any experience with domestic violence know th that these cases don't happen in isolation. That is, we don't get a slap and then run away. There are attendant and, and related, ancillary, whatever word you'd like to use, crimes that happen in almost all of these situations. It's extremely rare for me to charge just one count in a domestic violence related offense. Um, batterers often damage property. Sometimes that's property that is valuable, intrinsically valuable, disabling a car or um, cutting up clothing are some of the things we see from time to time, but it also can have um, a much deeper psychological impact when the damage is done to um, ripping up a wedding picture. Uh, or in tribal communities, um, ceremonial regalia being um, damaged is a really, really significant crime, and we don't have any way to prosecute those cases. Um, at Tulalip, it's against the law to prevent somebody from calling for help in relation to a domestic violence offense. So if he grabs her cell phone and throws it out of her reach, she's unable to get the help she needs and it's also a crime. But we can't prosecute that crime either because it is not a violent crime. Probably uh, the most frustrating and heartbreaking gap is the one that's been described by everybody on this panel and that is that we do not have jurisdiction over crimes against children. So, the Tulalip mom who's holding her newborn and is struck and pushed to the floor holding that baby, we can, we can arrest him for assaulting her, but the criminal endangerment visited upon that baby goes unpunished and unrecognized. Um, little Eli, who was whipped with a lamp cord, whipped with a lamp cord with a plug on the end of it, we can't prosecute that case either because his mom's case is prosecuted. He was a direct victim of violence, not simply endangered, but we have no recourse there. And, and, and there are several impacts there in terms of criminal history. You know, if, if I'm only charging the crime that I can, a misdemeanor assault can be something as minor as a, a shoulder check in a bar. You, you all know those kinds of crimes. When a person is reading a criminal history and sees a misdemeanor assault, well, <laughs> that in no way, in no way, communicates the magnitude of the, of the victimization that's taken place and the magnitude of the crimes that have been committed. So um, 
We've had a very, very successful relationship with our U.S. Attorney's Office. We work together on, on cases all the time, and by all the time I mean more than once a week we're in communication. We meet face-to-face -face on a regular basis. And that support, both from the department and from our local U.S. Attorney's Office, has been um, really amazing and, and invaluable. But I just have to leave you with the message that there's, there's still more to do. We still have work to do. Which brings us to our top three priority recommendations. And uh, uh, trust me, we had pages upon pages mm -hmm. of recommendations that came from our prosecutor's office and our attorney's office. And uh, so I asked that we, can we do our top three? Not in any order, but uh, these are three recommendations that, that we have. And that's to amend 904 of VAWA to enable tribal prosecutors to charge the full range of crimes that arise in the context of domestic violence, sexual assault, family violence, and we want to underline the victimization of children. I think that's been one of the most difficult parts of uh, the implementation and, and not serving justice to those children. Uh, to provide tribes with financial resources on an ongoing basis necessary for VAWA implementation, um, Congress auth authorized up to $25 million to implement this program uh, through t 2018, uh, but Congress has yet to appropriate any of those funds. Uh, we look forward to that day when it does happen. Um, uh, reauthorize, expand, and make permanent the Bureau of Prisons project as authorized by the Tribal Law, Law and Order Act. Uh, the, again, these are three priorities that we have, but again, there's, there's so much work, so much more to be done, but we're, um, we're really watching and we're learning and we're growing and we feel like we've been very successful thus far and we'll just continue our success by making these improvements. Well, thank you. I want to thank you, uh, um, all of you, for sharing the incredible, incredibly successful experiences in many respects that you've had with recognition that there are real limits that need to be addressed. I guess I'd like to start uh, the discussion and, and maybe, uh, with maybe the biggest of big picture questions, which is the point of all of this is to make uh, women uh, feel and be actually safer and to make perpetrators uh, understand that there are consequences that will be visited on them for their actions. And I guess I wonder whether you see an impact from the fact that at least for some of these crimes, you can now take action in a way that you couldn't before. You know, with respect to the perpetrator who said, oh, you can't touch me, um, uh, does he know different now? And do others similarly situated know different? So I'm interested if you see that an impact in, in how it, has it filtered down into the community that something has changed? I think it has to, uh, to some extent, uh, especially for that person who has been prosecuted. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think it's going to be difficult though because um, think about the context, 30 to 40 years uh, without any kind of jurisdiction uh, the community has been victimized. Um, it, it's a human rights issue and that has been happening for decades. So, you know, a year of VAWA uh, and a small change in jurisdiction uh, has, you know, it has impacted the community for sure. But it's going to take probably a decade to kind of heal the community and allow them to start to trust uh, law enforcement, trust the, the federal response, uh, and trust our criminal justice system. And so I think there's probably still a lot of underreporting. Uh, and I, I think with more outreach and with more successful prosecutions, uh, we'll get to a place where we need to be. I guess I'll have an example. Uh, well, this past week, um, last Monday, I met with. Uh, three victims and myself, four of us on Monday, and then uh, on Thursday met with uh, two other victims. And so they're talking about coming forward and finally telling their stories. So that, that to me says a lot. It says I, I believe I can come forward now and somebody's going to listen and, and justice will be served because the perpetrators, or all of the perpetrators uh, of these women that I met with are still walking around the reservation, are still there, and they have uh, never been prosecuted. Um, information hasn't come forward because these victims have believed that 
it, it, nothing would happen, so why report it? And it's embarrassing anyways, it's shameful. We're in a small community, if you are um, labeled, uh, you know, uh, well, there, there's all those labels that many of us know about that, that we, the women don't want to go through. And so uh, for us on reservation life, uh, you know, some people feel, well you, well, you can move away to be safe, but we move away. That's that's our traditional homeland. That's grandma and grandpa live there, aunties and uncles. All of our family for generations have lived there. There's nothing else. So that, that is why we have a high rate of suicide, a tremendous high rate of suicide. So um, there's so much hope, and, and we'll just continue to, to share the message and prosecute and provide justice. Michelle? Yeah. And so at Tulalip, we have mandatory sentencing requirements, which include domestic violence perpetrators treatment. Um, quite often, we require no contact orders. I mean, everything that you would normally see in any other tribal or any other court system. We not only hold the, uh, the offender accountable by incarcerating him, but we also, you know, have that suspended sentence and require services because oftentimes these people are part of the community. There's six of our 11 defendants have children in common with the victim. And so it's to our benefit for them to get healthy. Previously, we wouldn't have any sort of stick to hold over them. I guess that's the wrong uh, use of term there. But um, um, we wouldn't have anything to, to encourage them to get well. And so now we do. And um, uh, our tribal council has been very specific that they want these uh, perpetrators excluded from the reservation. So that's another tool that we're using. And as a result, if they want to come on back on the reservation, then they have to request a deferral, which would require them to engage in further services. We're trying to make our communities healthy and safe. And, and we are just seeing a tremendous impact on this. And, um, and people are trusting that these crimes are finally going to be prosecuted and people held accountable. So it's been a wonderful resource for our tribes in this last year and a half. Well, I think as the Attorney General said, who you prosecute says something about who you value and what crimes you prosecute. And I think that was a very important statement. So let me ask, that. there was a lot of discussion about uh, the limitations, particularly the inability to prosecute, uh, whether under Castleman or the, the, the statute itself. Uh, which doesn't reach, for example, crimes against children that may have happened, frankly, in the same, you know, you know five-minute period when the attack on a, a Native woman may have occurred. Talk about the challenges of training law enforcement and prosecutors to deal with that situation and, and have to uh, sort of adjust their response based on, well, are you dating? Are you in a relationship? You know, or, or, the, or with the child? Because that's got to be, just from a training and implementation perspective, very complex and difficult. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very, very complicated question, and we learned it the hard way, at least from the prosecutor's office, with an acquittal. And then uh, at the end of the jury trial was done, um, we had some people, and Fred was one of them, who went out and spoke to the jury and wanted to figure out what it was that was the hang-up, and we found out it was the relationship question. And then we kind of peeled it back a little bit more and discovered how truly difficult that actually is. Uh, now, it's a same-sex uh, relationship, and these two individuals weren't openly uh, open to the community about their relationship. Uh, or that, or that they were um, homosexual, and they they just weren't open about it to the community. And then the jurors opened our eyes, and they each had something different that they said, "This is what a relationship would have meant to me. This is what I would have liked to see." And it's almost impossible to accommodate six different perspectives of what a relationship is. Some people said they wanted to see Facebook statuses or photos. <laughs> um, some wanted text messages, um, um, you know, public displays of affection, uh, different things. They all wanted to hear more about some sort of sexual relationship. And we did present evidence of a sexual episode. But apparently one sexual episode, that could just be friends. I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But that, those are questions that then you're faced to ask. And then you have to consider that our, jur our jury was mixed up of, um, I think the, the oldest was uh, uh, just under 50 years old, the youngest was mid-twenties, and if you were to think of an elder 
and somebody who's 19 what their definition of being in a relationship is. Um, that's pretty hard to encompass in a, our detective who investigated is a, a, a six foot six, he, he looks like a, um, you know, NFL lineman and he's supposed to ask an individual who's gone through a very traumatic experience who wasn't open about his sexual orientation mm -hmm. these very intimate questions. And, I mean, imagine that dynamic. Um, you know, hindsight, 2020. But even then, how do you uncover some of these issues? Um, so that was a, a much bigger question than we anticipated, and it was highlighted by the jury trial. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the questions I think that uh, probably is on a lot of folks' mind is, you know, why aren't more tribe, tribal nations implementing these programs? And we certainly know, and I know you all have been leading the way in working with other tribes to, to implement the provisions of VAWA. But what do you see as the obstacles uh, for the, the tribes that you talk to and work with in terms of uh, implementing those, these provisions? Well, first of all, it's expensive. Um, Any time that you're providing police um, judges, prosecutors, public defenders, jail, probation officers, services, you have attached expenses on that. And a number of tribes do not have the resources to do that, hence probably the 25 million that was allocated but yet appro not appropriated. Um, the other thing is that um, some of the tri tribal constitutions may, um, have, may need to be amended because some constitutions are specific as to what, who the tribal court has jurisdiction over. And so it could say a tribal member, a Native American from a federally recognized tribe, etc. And so a constitutional amendment takes a significant amount of time and resources. Um, but, uh, you know, some tribes, uh, you know, are just really remote and ha don't uh, have the same ability to access resources that, that our tribes have been fortunate to do. And also, we have tremendous leadership. The Tulalip Board of Directors has really designated this as one of their key issues and has put a lot of financial resources towards this um, because we're looking at safety for the community. So I know folks are short on time because you all have to go to the White House and persuade them to support any number of initiatives that we're talking about here today. Um, but, but let me ask you, since you have a DOJ audience, I know live streaming throughout DOJ, um, uh, can, can both of you talk about things that uh, have worked well in your partnership with the Department of Justice, whether it's one of the SAUSA programs, uh, and things that you uh, feel like uh, we still need to work on in your collaboration with DOJ? Um, we, um, you know, we work really well with, with DOJ. We've gotten a lot of uh, feedback from a, a lot of uh, people who, who have a tremendous amount of insight into the criminal jurisdiction. Uh, we do have the, the SALSA program down in, at, at Bosquayaca. We have three going on, on four SALSAs now. Um, one of, the, one of the big things that's going to be coming up as, as the tribes are now starting to convict and, and put some of these offenders on, on probation terms is, is re-entry type services. Uh, maybe some sort of partnerships or agreements can, or even facilitating some of these agreements and partnerships with outside service providers. Um, some of the, the reservations, you know, some of these defendants now, we have two of them that are on post-conviction. Um, they're going into the city. And I, as, as soon as they get picked up on the warrant, we already know that they're going to they're gonna make it an issue of, well, they're, they don't want to come to the reservation. They shouldn't have to come out here. Um, you know, then you get into health care costs, if there's health care associated with it, any sort of services, IHS money. However, your, your um, service providers are funded, that becomes an issue. So we're going to have to start looking to making some uh, agreements and partnerships with uh, potentially federal uh, service provide, providers, state or local providers to help with some of those rehabilitative services that any other um, defendant or w would receive if they were going through regular state courts. So, I mean, that's one, one avenue, one really um, recent um, issue that I see is going to be coming up more and more frequently as, as these convictions start rolling through. 
the support that the that the department has given us as we've um, begun this journey um, are we call it the ITWIG, the Intertribal Working Group, which has been um, really invaluable as, as tribes who are implementing and contemplating and implementing have gotten together to share resources, best practices, all of that. And the Department of Justice has really been um, part of the foundation of, of that work in an, in an advisory and a leadership role, both. And I have to say that we have the best assistant U.S. attorney in America, in the Western District of Washington, and I love working with her. Um, and, you can and, say and, the name, everybody in DOJ will see that. Oh, do you know Yi Ting Wu? <laughs> she rocks. And, um, and, and not just because she listens to me, although that goes a long way, um, but we actually staff cases together, and, you know, we know what or we think we know what's best for our communities and and it's not always just who's going to pay the bill for the incarceration there are other considerations that that can be brought to bear and should be brought to bear when you're making filing decisions and sentencing recommendations and sometimes having them removed to the federal system and disappear forever is is an appropriate thing sometimes seeing justice done on the reservation is more important than the length of the sentence or who pays the bill and and I feel like Yi Ting and I are, are real partners in making some of those determinations together about, well, I can charge this, but I can't charge that, and, well, this is what we, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a staffing issue every week, um, looking at cases together about how we're going to proceed. So I, I just, I appreciate that more than I can say. Um, and quickly, I just want to say just how wonderful the ITWG has been. Um, the Office of Tribal Justice has been a tremendous partner in this process. They have been available morning, noon, and night, um, sometimes weekends. They are listening to us. They're being creative in looking for solutions. They've just been a tremendous partner, and I look forward to working with them on the TAP program and hope that we can get the Intertribal Work Group um, phase two and the, with the TAP program because that's going to be a highly critical um, technical program that tribes will need some partnership with. Well, I want to thank everybody, thank the panel for sharing your experiences and, and continuing with the extraordinary work you're doing to make uh, women and tribal nations uh, safe, which is the goal that I think all of us share. And with that, I'll turn it over, back over to B. Great. Uh, I, can you all just join me in thanking Tom and uh, our staff folks in Canada for happy to have I know we could probably talk all afternoon, and it's been just an, an incredible honor to have each of you here with us today. Um, we value our continued partnership as we all strive for justice in our communities. And I want to thank all of you for being here today, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.